Hello, Bio 104 students. In this lecture, we'll be covering the principles of ecology. So here's an outline of the lecture, and we'll revisit this outline at the end of the lecture where, we'll, where we will review point by point. Here are a number of terms that will be introduced through the course of this lecture. Okay, what is ecology? We can think of ecology as the interaction of organisms with their biotic and abiotic environment. We can think about the processes that govern the distribution and abundance of organisms. We could study the transformation and flux of energy and materials through ecosystems. And subdisciplines of ecology include population ecology, which focuses on the dynamics of single species. We can think about community ecology, the interactions among multiple species and ecosystem ecology, which is the interactions of abiotic and biotic components of ecosystems. All right, all populations have the potential for an exponential growth. And a great example are cane toads in Australia. Now cane toads, about 100 individuals, were introduced in Australia in 1935 to help control a cane beetle population. Since that time, cane toads have exploded with regard to their population size. In fact, they've had an exponential growth. We look at population size through time, where recent estimates put the number of cane toads at 200 million. This population has grown exponentially. Another species that has experienced fairly recent exponential population growth has been our own, humans. Starting about the midpoint of the 19th century, that is the onset of the Industrial Revolution, population of our species has exploded since that, in that short period of time. And in fact, in my own lifetime of only 50 years, the number of humans on Earth has nearly tripled, with estimates of 2015 approaching 9.5 billion people on Earth. Now, perhaps some of the good news is that the rate of population growth shown here on the y-axis through time has been slowing down since about the mid 1960s or early 1970s and the current decline of the growth of the population rate of humans is projected to continue. Now resources are what eventually place a limit on growth of populations. So if we look at logistic population growth, the early growth is exponential. Then we hit an inflection point where the growth, the point of fastest growth begins to slow down. And eventually growth will, will fall to zero once the carrying capacity of the population is reached. Now we can think of different life history patterns as being characterized populations of species by their survivorship. That is thinking about what is the probability of survivorship at different stages of their life cycle. So here we're looking at the number of survivors on the y-axis and we're looking at the age in years. So young ages, older ages. So by looking at the probability of survivorship, what we find is the shape of these curves, curves show common life history patterns. So for example, type one survivorship curve are basically most individuals are surviving to old age. There's a steep decline late in life. Type one survivorship curve uh, species tend to have low reproductive rates. They also provide parental care. And this reduces the mortality at the early stages. So examples include uh, long-lived organisms such as humans, elephants, and whales. The type two survivorship curve are those species and populations that are a constant risk of mortality at all ages. So if we look here at the type two, the probability of mortality stays the same at every year of the life of the individual or the, in, in the total of the population. Whereas type three, there's low survivorship early in life and higher survivorship once they re reach maturity. Type three survivorship curve species tend to produce many offspring, and examples include insects, marine 
uh, invertebrates and annual plants. Now, species have a life history strategy. And if you think about this, and we'll illustrate this with the classic frog tadpole life cycle, that at these different stages of the life history, lineages and populations are faced with challenges, evolutionary challenges that are reflected in the timing of these events. So for example, how fast would the frog eggs develop? When would the frog metamorphose? How fast would the individuals grow? How large will they grow? When do they begin reproducing? How often do they reproduce? And whether or not they provide parental care. These are the critical events that are facing the life cycle of, an, an, of a species. And strategies we could think of as the average timing in the nature of these important life history events. Now, there's, with, when it comes to life history strategies, there's always life history trade-offs. We can think of a positive allocation to one aspect of a life history that's going to negatively impact another aspect of the life history. So for example, these trade-offs might be limited energy expended over one aspect of a life cycle cannot be invested in another. Increased frequency of reproduction can lower lifespan. Bigger eggs versus fewer eggs, fewer more eggs versus smaller eggs. Trade-offs like this occur throughout life cycle, life history strategies. Now, there are two extremes of life history strategies, first articulated by Yale EEB's very own EEB DUS Professor Stephen Stern. Our strategists allow for high population growth rates. K strategists persist at or near the carrying capacity of their environment. So we think of our strategists as basically populations that are maintaining that high population growth rate. K strategists are having a lower growth rate, but they're right near the carrying capacity. Now, these extremes of R and K strategists have different characteristics. For example, R strategists with regard to reproductive strategy are typically reproducing once, but a greater allocation to reproduction than growth, and this results in a large number of offspring. Whereas K strategists are reproducing more than once, giving a greater allocation to growth than reproduction, resulting in fewer offspring. With regard to survivorship, our strategists have shorter lifespans. K strategists tend to have larger lifespans. And our strategists tend to typ typically have a type three survivorship curve. See the slide before this one. Uh, well, we talked about survivorship curves, whereas K strategists tend to have a type one or a type two survivorship curve. Now, if you look at population growth in R strategists, that period of exponential growth, R, is followed by a periodic or seasonal population decline. Whereas with K strategists, the population size is slowly growing and stabilizes at or near the carrying capacity. And then here are examples of organisms that would fall broadly under these two extreme life history strategies, R strategists and K strategists. Now we could think of the R and K illustrated here in our population size versus time XR or logistic growth, where R selection is occurring in population that they're maintaining low densities relative to their carrying capacity. Whereas K selected lineages or, or organisms are occurring in populations and species maintained at high densities near or at their carrying capacity. Okay, now one important aspect of population growth is thinking about species have finite geographic ranges. Not all species are distributed everywhere. So just the fact that these geographic ranges um, are limited would, would, uh, would impose the idea that population growth will be limited with regard to the geographic ranges. So what limits geographic ranges? Now, 
what limits geographic ranges to a large extent is the fact that species have or occupy niches. So what is a niche? We could think of niche in three different definitions, but we're really gonna be focusing on the Hutchinsonian niche. First, the Grinnellian niche is the sum of the habitat requirements that allow a species to per persist and produce offspring. The Eltonian niche is the role of a species in its community relative to its habitat. Now the Hutchinsonian niche is an nth dimensional niche hypervolume of the environmental conditions and resources that define the requirements or the tolerances. So imagine we're thinking about a freshwater fish, but that freshwater fish is not found everywhere in the riverine habitat. So we can go out, we can measure the depth, the temperature, the flow rate, the substrate, and see given those environmental variables and measuring where the species actually occurs within, within those, that would produce the hypervolume of the environmental conditions and resources. We could throw diet uh, into that as well. That would define the uh, requirements and tolerances for that hypothetical species of fish. So let's go ahead and look at that on the diagram below. So let's think about a hypothetical niche in three dimensions for this river dwelling fish. First, we have temperature on the X axis. Then we have humidity on the Y axis. And then let's throw in current flow on the Z axis. And so you can see we have this three dimensional space where with these environmental variables, this is where we are finding the organism occurs. This is the Hutchinsonian niche. Now, there's a difference between the realized niche and the fundamental niche. The fundamental niche is the one that we were measuring here. So we go out and we measure these variables, and we assume that these are the, the variables that comprise the, the, the constructed niche, our construction of the niche of that species. However, the realized niche is essentially the places where the species actually lives relative to all the places where the species may live, okay? So the realized niche is a subset of that fundamental niche. Now, in a sense, it could just be a matter of time. So here is a map of Australia. We're looking at the environmental variables of where habitats that cane toads occupy. If we go ahead and look throughout the Australian continent, other areas that have those same environmental variables, we see that there are areas of Australia that are not occupied by cane toads. In this diagram, this line shows the delimit of cane toad range, which is up here in the northeastern part of the continent. They are not on the other side of this line. However, it could just be that there hasn't been enough time meaning that maybe this is an eventuality where this front will move forward. Now, or it could be that the species is in competition with other species. In the idea of niche overlap, in that species that are too similar would have to basically utilize different niches to facilitate coexistence. So basically, if there's no, the species are similar, that their niche overlaps, so we're looking at the niche distribution of two species here, if the overlap is large, we may argue, or we may guess, that there'd be no coexistence between those two species, meaning they would not be found in the same geographic area. Limiting similarity is allowing the maximum level of niche overlap between two species that facilitates co-occurrence. So the overlap in a sense is medium size. There's a limiting similarity. Whereas if the niches are different enough, coexistence is possible because niche overlap is minimal. So with regard to the realized niche versus the fundamental niche, it may be there just hasn't been enough time for that species to, to disperse and occupy all aspects of the fundamental niche in terms of its geographic space or it may be the species is limited from utilizing the fundamental niche because of interactions with other organisms. And this brings us to a very famous experiment that illustrates quite nicely 
the difference between the fundamental and, and a realized niche. That is in competition, restricting the species ranges. Okay, so let me set up the natural history for you here. On the rocky intertidal coast of the North Atlantic, that is uh, Europe and North America, there are two species of barnacle. There's Semibalanus and Cthalmus, all right? And they compete for space. Plectonic larvae of both species settle in the intertidal zone and metamorphose to sessile adults. So their larvae are distributed throughout the intertidal zone, but the, the adults are gonna settle and they become sessile. They can't move after that. The smaller size, Cthalmus, live at the top of the intertidal here, and they're resistant to desiccation. The larger Semibalanus live at the bottom part of the intertidal, and they're sensitive to desiccation. So Cthalmus is resistant to desiccation, Semibalanus is uh, sensitive to desiccation. And there's little overlap between the areas occupied by the adults of the two species. Why is that? And that was the setup for the experiment. So back in 1961, Connell experimentally removed one or the other species from the rocky intertidal in Scotland. So Cthalmus larvae settle both in the high and low areas of the intertidal, but they thrive only at the lower levels when only when semibalanus is removed, okay? So you can get Cthalmus in the lower intertidal when semibalanus is removed. Experimentally removing uh, Cthalmus from locations high in the intertidal did not result in the replacement by semibalanus. Remember, that species is sensitive to desiccation. So the conclusion was that competitive interaction between the two species results in a distinctive pattern of zonation. And this is an illustration of the fundamental and realized niches. So the idea here is that Cthalmus has a fundamental niche that can occupy the entire intertidal. However, it has a realized niche that is restricted to the upper part of the intertidal because of competition with Semibalanus. Where Semibalanus's fundamental niche closely matches its realized niche because it cannot occupy the upper intertidal because it's sensitive to desiccation, okay? So between these two species, there's a much greater disparity in the fundamental and realized niche for Cthalmus and there is much less, in fact, almost no disparity between the fundamental and realized niche of Semibalanus. So competition between the two species is what is driving the difference between the realized and fundamental niche for Cthalmus. Now, competition is just one of a variety of species interactions. In fact, we could teach a whole course on species interactions. And in addition to competition, uh, we'll talk a little bit later in the lecture uh, about predation or herbivory. We're not going to talk much about parasitism. We're going to talk a little bit about mutualism, and we talked about competition. But interaction among um, uh, organisms is a, a fascinating area of ecology, and as I said, is one that could merit its own course. Okay, but I just want to show you a really great example of mutualism. And mutualism involves, um, that we'll talk about, is an acacia uh, tree, kind of the, the, uh, the iconic plant of the African savanna. It's a legume, it's uh, related to uh, beans and peas. And the acacia have uh, protective ants. Now, protective ants in trees is actually quite common. Uh, it's particularly common in the tropics. So I had an experience where uh, I was working in a rainforest in tropical Peru, Amazonian Peru. And in this uh, very dense rainforest in the Manu National Forest, uh, I saw a tree with a clearing around it. And there were very few clearings uh, in the rainforest. And I said, oh, what a great place to sit and, and have my sandwich. Well, um, that was a triplaris tree that has a commensalate uh, ant 
of which uh, they immediately started falling on and stinging me. So that was my last time leaning up uh, against a tree with protective ants. Okay, so back to our story is we have the acacia tree in the African savanna, and the spines of the acacia, uh, these are really uh, large uh, spines on the tree, and they have these little domatia that serve as homes for the ant. And the plant is providing nectar uh, with regard, uh, provided by these extra uh, floral nectaries, uh, giving the, the ants are use, using to get nectar. And they also provide food uh, to the ants, this uh, nutrient rich package called Beltian bodies. So what's going on here? Why, are, why is the acacia uh, plant tree providing uh, actual places to live and food for these ants. Well, the survivor of the the survivor the, the survival of these plants or these trees is strongly dependent upon the ants. So what the ants are doing is they're patrolling, uh, providing protection from herbivores. So if another insect lands on that tree and says, "Oh, I'm going to take advantage of these luscious leaves or even take these Beltian bodies." They're going to have to deal with the beatdown that's delivered by the uh, acacia ants. And so, if you look here, just to show that there is an effect, we look at acacia stems that are containing uh, herbivorous insects. With ants, there's a very low herbivory pressure. So, this is the number of herbivores. And without ants, you could see there's a dramatic uh, percentage, a dramatic increase of. Uh, stems containing these herbivorous insects. And in fact, if you look at survival, I believe this is of, of saplings, the survival percent basically without ants uh, crashes dramatically over a period of just a few months, whereas survivorship with ants remains very high. So the ants are providing a benefit to the plants, the plants are providing a benefit to the ants. Okay. Now, we're starting to talk about the interactions among multiple organisms. This takes us to community ecology. Organisms live in communities of producers and consumers, which form a food web. Energy flows up trophic levels of the food web. So trophic is related to feeding. So we have plants, which are, our primary, which are the primary producers. Primary consumers are the organisms eating the plants. You then have omnivores, which are eating both plants and other, other animals in this case. And then you have the secondary and tertiary consumers. These are the top predators of these communities. And energy is flowing from the primary producers all the way to the secondary and tertiary consumers. Now, plants as the primary producers are constantly under attack by herbivores. And these interactions influence the population dynamics, both of the plants and of the herbivores. So here's a great example showing the abundance of Klamath weed cover out on the Pacific coast of North America. And looking on this other y-axis, the abundance of beetles. And looking in a period of, it looks like an eight year period starting at about 1950, there was a high abundance of Klamath weed, a low abundance of beetle, as the beetle population density is increasing, the Klamath weed population density is decreasing. Once the resource decreases, you have a crash of, sorry, you have a crash of the primary consumer, in this case the beetle, and then the process potentially will start over again with the growth of the, 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 the primary producer, the Klamath weed in this case. Now what I'm showing you here on the right, one factoid I would love for you to take away from uh, studying Bio 104 is this idea, the constant attack that plants are under, and the fact that all of these wonderful secondary compounds that plants are producing, plants are the ultimate uh, biochemical engineers of the living world, that these compounds are being produced to fight off the constant attack that they're facing. And this just shows here a diagrammatic plant going all the way from the roots up to uh, the flowers and eventually the fruit and showing, including the pollen, uh, 
uh, showing the different parts of the plant and the type of attacks that they're, they're constantly under, and the type of typically insects that are utilizing those resources from plants. Okay, now in looking at the interaction between the primary uh, producer and primary consumer, we saw that they can affect the population dynamics of one another. As a, abundance of the primary producer was up, we have an increase of the abundance of the primary consumer, the primary producer population declines, followed by a decline of the primary consumer, in the case before the Klamath weed and the beetle. Now, this is a very famous lynx and hare uh, model or example that you probably were exposed to in your high school biology. And what's interesting is the data noting the time, the midpoint of the 19th century through uh, the midpoint of the 1930s, this data are from the records of furs that were collected by the Hudson Bay Company. And if we're looking on this y-axis, we're looking at the number of hares in the thousands, and we're looking at the number of lynx in the thousands in, in orange here. And what we see is when we have a high population of lynx, we have a low population of hare, followed by a decline of the lynx population with an increase in the hare. And this cycle repeats itself through time, through about almost a century. Now, we can see this oscillating predator-prey uh, uh, relationship. So predator-prey densities on the y-axis through time on the x. And we basically can hit a limit cycle where there's a stable predator-prey uh, cycle. So now we're looking at predator density, prey density, forming this oval relationship, whereas prey density is up, uh, predator density is up, sorry, prey density is low. As prey density starts recovering, we're seeing the predator density declining, facilitating the increase of the prey density. Okay, now, one thing that's really interesting about uh, trophic interactions and food webs is this idea of direct and indirect effects on populations. So we saw how a beetle can affect the density of a plant and the plants affecting the density of the beetle and how the lynx and hair densities are dependent on each other. So these would be direct interactions where the solid arrow is representing this direct interaction. So the lynx eats, uh, Insects eat plant, lynx eat hair, et cetera. Now, indirect interactions are really fascinating, and we're gonna dive into an example, uh, the introduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park. Uh, I kind of a, a notice or that this is still a controversial example. Not everyone agrees with the conclusions uh, that we'll be talking about in this lecture, but it, it's a fascinating example of indirect interactions uh, with indirect effects in trophic interactions. So what do I mean by an indirect interaction here? Well, here, this is the, the food web that we had looked at a few slides ago. The idea, if wolves are eating elk, and elk are eating young trees, so if wolves are controlling elk, then the idea is that young trees will see uh, are, are being affected by wolves preying on elk, okay? All right, so here is this fun but controversial example of wolves in Yellowstone National Park. Okay, so let's look at the top graph here. We're looking at the number of elk in the thousands, okay? Now we're starting this data, uh, the time period of 1900. We don't have data on the elk population until a time period after wolves were eliminated, okay? So wolves are eliminated in 1926. So now we have data on the elk. Now, from this time up until 1968, elk were culled in the park, meaning that hunters were invited to come in or uh, game managers were coming in and they were, they were shooting elk. They were trying to control the elk population by removing individuals from the population. So elk culling is suspended in 1968. In the absence of wolves and of culling, elk populations grow rapidly, okay? 
Now, wolves are restored into Yellowstone National Park in 1995, and we start seeing a decline in the elk population. All right, now check this out. What we're looking at here is the percent recruitment of aspen trees, okay? That is from one generation to the next, what is the recruitment? How many new individuals are we adding to the population in the park? Now, we have data going back to 1900. So 1900 to 1920, when wolves are present, Aspen recruitment, that is the introduction of new individuals of population is really high. Once wolves are eliminated in 1926, basically recruitment of Aspen starts to crash. That is because elks are eating the sapling young Aspen. Obviously an elk is not gonna eat an entire Aspen tree, right? But elk are browsing on these uh, sapling Aspen as they're coming up. So elk browsing on the Aspen is preventing recruitment of the Aspen. And you can see in the periods, the decades of the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, there was essentially zero recruitment of new Aspen into the park. However, as soon as wolves were restored, Aspen forests began to regenerate. They began to uh, recruit individuals again. So wolves are influencing the elk population, which in turn is influencing plant regeneration. Now, the effect is gonna go far beyond just aspen recruitment because plant growth and regeneration is going to influence the actual dynamics of riverine habitats, influencing water flow and erosion as well. So, all I'm hiding here is part of the wolf with my talking head in the left corner. So now we could think about the effect of the reintroduction of wolves on other organisms. So what I'm showing you here in the top left graph, that is we have the population here on the y-axis and on the x-axis in all these graphs is the year. So 1995 wolves are introduced and here's the population of wolves year by year. Then here's the population of elk in the thousands. After the introduction of wolves, elk population is declining. Then looking year by year, the percent browsed, that is go out and measure how many plants have been browsed by elk. And you could see the percent of all of the plants that are being browsed was nearly 100%. Soon after the introduction of, of, of wolves, but basically drops dramatically after the effect of wolves. Now, these are different plots for different habitats. These are basically uplands versus riparian. Riparian are areas around rivers. And you can see that the decline of browsing was most dramatic in areas around rivers and streams. Then if we're looking at the height of the aspens, we could see that after the introduction of wolves, the height in centimeters of the growth of those, new in, of those newly recruited individuals is dramatically higher than it was prior to the introduction of wolves where the elks were browsing on these young sapling aspen trees. Now, the, what wasn't anticipated is the fact that other species of trees were rebounding as well. In particular, trees that are found around river banks and riparian areas. So cottonwoods were essentially non-existent in the park. They start rebounding and willow trees, which are often associated with riparian areas, begun rebounding as well after the introduction of wolves and the declining of the elk population. And then beavers start making a comeback because the riparian areas have more uh, plant and tree cover. And then bison, start making a comeback as well. All from the introduction of one species into the park, a reintroduction. They were originally there, they were eliminated in the early part of the first, the last part of the first quarter of the 20th century. They're reintroduced and we see these dramatic effects across all of these other species and the dynamics of population growth in, in some of these species 
such as the aspen tree from the introduction of one top predator, the wolf. So carnivores, you know, can have this indirect effect on plants. That is by controlling the herbivore populations, they can then have a indirect effect on the plant populations. Okay, now this idea of, of organisms, in a sense, being critical to the dynamics of other organisms in the populations is really, or, or the community, is really nicely illustrated through this concept of the keystone predator. Now, keystone predators can structure the community by exerting a top-down control. So this is a famous experiment that was done, I believe, in the late 1960s. Okay, so the idea is that in this community, we have Pizaster, a starfish that essentially eats a lot of mytilus, this mussel, which allows other species to inhabit the substrate. When the starfish are removed, the, the mussel outcompetes everything else and the diversity crashes. Okay, so the starfish is controlling the mussel. So we're looking at the number of species in the community by year, and these were different experimental uh, uh, manipulations like we saw with the barnacle example, Connell's work. So in communities where the starfish, Pizaster, is not removed, you could see species diversity is fairly high, between 16 and 20 species. And essentially, all of the conditions where Pizaster, the starfish, is removed, basically, the mussel completely takes over, dominates, the, and, can, and occupies all of the substrate, and essentially, the species diversity crashes. The idea here is that the keystone predator is structuring this community in the way that a keystone holds together uh, an archway that this species, Pizaster, the keystone species, is holding together the species diversity of this rocky intertidal. So you remove the keystone on an arch, an architectural element, the entire system collapses. You remove a keystone predator from a community, the species diversity of the entire community collapses. So it's these species interactions that are facilitating the the actual species diversity of these communities. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears a bit and we're not gonna be talking about the interactions of species. We're gonna be thinking about the dynamics that affect how and why species are distributed the way they are. And in fact, we're gonna be thinking about the diversity of species. So this is a set of theory called island biogeographic theory. Now, island biogeographic theory doesn't just apply to islands, but it applies broadly to understanding the uh, dynamics of extinction and diversity in areas of the planet. Okay, so the questions we're gonna be asking is how does species diversity scale with the area of a landmass? And how does species diversity scale with the distance of an island from a mainland? And what factors account for these patterns? And what we're really interested in, what are the critical variables that are determining species diversity on land masses or islands? Okay, now there's a fundamental pattern that larger areas harbor more species. There are fewer species on smaller islands. So here we're looking at amphibians and reptiles in the West Indies. And if we're looking at the area is square kilometers, the number of species on the y-axis, the area of the island on the x-axis, we could see that the larger islands, Hispaniola and Cuba, have a lot more species than the smaller islands do. And this holds for many groups of organisms. So here we're looking at diversity of species as measured by wetland area in different organismal groups leave from Ontario. So we see this with uh, looking at the wetland area for plants, birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. So the larger the wetland area, the more species diversity we find in these different groups. Why is that? 
So this question was addressed and rather successfully and famously by MacArthur Wilson in 1967 with their introduction of island biogeographic theory. The, it's the idea that equilibrium diversity is based on rates of colonization and extinction. And this varies with island size and distance. So what we're looking at here is the rate of colonization here in orange and the rate of extinction in blue. And essentially, their relationship is allowing us to then determine or predict the number of species, in this case, on an island. So the number of species are here on this x-axis. So the idea is that as you increase the number of species on an island, successful colonization is dropping off because these species are occupying the niches and extinction rises. And the equilibrium between these two processes is where they're balanced will then predict the number of species on the island. So we're looking at the equilibrium between the rate of extinction I'm sorry, the rate of colonization, the rate of extinction to determine, that will determine the number of species on the island. Okay, so let's look at this graph here in that smaller islands are gonna have a steeper extinction curve, sorry about that, are gonna have a steeper extinction curve and support fewer species than larger islands. Larger islands don't have as extreme of an extinction curve. And what we're going to see is that Smaller islands will have fewer species than larger islands. Now here, the colors are reversed, but bear with me, meaning that the rate of colonization is now blue, the rate of extinction is now orange. The idea that islands that are far from the source, mainland, will experience fewer colonization events and therefore support fewer species. Islands that are closer to the mainland will have more colonization events and will accumulate more species. So they will have a higher species diversity. Now, if we bring this together, what we see is that small islands far from the mainland will have fewer species, whereas large islands near the mainland will have more species. So this idea of the IR or this set of theory, island biogeographic theory, is very, very important. And please study this topic in your textbook readings covered by these two pages here. And you should be able to think about what would diversity dynamics look like with regard to island size and proximity to the mainland. Now, the species area relationship and island biogeographic theory, even though if we're not applying it to islands specifically, allow us to make predictions about the loss of biodiversity when we're reducing available habitat or when areas have shrunk in the past due to climate change. Basically, the rule of thumb is 90% less area uh, results in about 50% less species diversity. So we could be thinking about what is happening to species richness when certain habitats are reduced, such as forest area that's reduced by human activity. So here's some depressing uh, images. If you look at forest cover in Western Ecuador, dating from 1938 to 1988, we have a dramatic decline of forest cover. And even here in the continental United States, we look at forest cover in 1620 and the dramatic decline of forest cover by 1920. So we have to think about what does the reduction of this habitat mean with regard to the downstream consequences of species diversity. In fact, some people argue that we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction being driven primarily by human activity. Okay, now we're going to talk briefly, very briefly, about the global carbon cycle. There's essentially the one thing I want you to take away from this is in studying this diagram showing where basically carbon is sequestered on Earth that the two largest pools of carbon are carbon-containing minerals and in rocks, including fossil fuels, and dissolved in our oceans, all right? Now, atmospheric carbon is rather low relative to these other carbon uh, sources on, on Earth. 
However, its atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide, is the immediate source of carbon for terrestrial organisms. That is plants and other photosynthetic organisms, such as cyanobacteria. Now, this is more uh, for your, your edification, but also perhaps education of your crazy uncle at next Thanksgiving dinner. So when people argue that atmospheric carbon dioxide is not increasing due to human activity, well, the evidence strongly supports against that idea. Indeed, the evidence strongly supports the idea that human activity is responsible for increased CO2. So here, if we just look over the past 60 years or so, we see that each year there's a rise and fall of CO2 concentration in the Northern Hemisphere. That has to do with uh, winter, respiration is uh, basically exceeding photosynthesis in plants. And basically, what we're seeing, though, is despite this annual fluctuation driven by uh, the physiology of plants and the seasonality of plants, that there's been a dramatic increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide dating from uh, as recent as 1960. And if we put this on a larger time scale, uh, we could see that our atmospheric CO2 has this uh, cycle of increase and decrease through the over the past 450,000 years or so. However, what we see is at a time relative to the onset of the Industrial Revolution, there has been a dramatic increase of CO2 levels. They are basically at a level that we have not seen anywhere else in deep historical time or deep time. And they're going up because uh, humans are burning fossil fuels and, uh, and uh, this is what's driving this dramatic increase. Now, bear in mind that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It traps in heat in the atmosphere. So as CO2 goes up, uh, uh, temperature will go up. This is uh, climate change uh, directed towards, you might have heard of, global warming. And we see the evidence not only for a change in uh, mean annual temperature globally, but we see its effects at parts of the planet, such as the polar ice caps, which shown here in the red line, have decreased dramatically uh, from the period of over just the past 10 years or so. Okay, so let's return to cane toads in Australia. Remember with cane toads, uh, we, we, we mentioned that they have this uh, dramatic exponential growth here. I will now cover with my talking head. And the population has also expanded rapidly. So what we're doing is if we're looking at the areas occupied by cane toads and coloring it by how rapidly they've been uh, expanding their range. We see that they're dramatically expanding their range in relatively recent time. And their invasion speed is actually faster in these new areas. So what we're looking at here in this uh, color diagram is their invasion speed. So they're getting faster. Why are they getting faster? Well, basically, cane toads, this is a great example of the how evolution can happen on very uh, short timescales and ecological timescales. Similar, we talked about with Darwin's finches, whereas the beak size uh, matching the availability of, of seeds on the Galapagos Islands. So cane toads have evolved longer legs. They're moving farther and they're moving faster. However, there are some trade-offs here. Basically, we're seeing the head size of vulnerable snakes have also evolved. They're decreased in size with longer bodies with the cane toad invasion. And perhaps checking a trade-off with cane toads evolving longer legs and moving farther and faster is that cane toads with long legs are experiencing essentially arthritis on their spine. So there's a, phys a physical trade-off to this rapid evolution that's happening with cane toads. Okay, uh, what we were trying to do in this lecture is giving you an overview of the principles of ecology.
We talked about the subdisciplines of ecology, population community ecology and ecosystem ecology. And in dealing with population dynamics, we were interested in exponential growth, logistic growth and carrying capacities. And we looked at common life history patterns as reflected in survivorship curves and thinking about the extremes of life history strategies that is R versus K strategists. We were thinking about what are the limits to geographic range size of species and actually linking range size as a limiting factor to exponential growth itself. And we over, gave an overview of concepts of niche. That is, we're focusing on the Hutchinsonian niche concept and showing the difference between the fundamental and realized niches of these species. We briefly covered different species interactions focusing primarily on competition and predation, although we had a nice example of mutualism with the acacia trees and their ants. And we talked about predator-prey interactions, characteristics of population, cycles of population size, top-down control of community structure, and keystone predators. Very important, very important concept is island, bioge island biogeography and species area relationship. That is, what is the expectation of species diversity given an area? And then we touch briefly on the carbon cycle. Okay, until next time, be well, be safe, see you soon.